All right, well, everyone's in for a big treat. This is uh, going to be the most provocative panel of the conference for sure. Uh, so my name is David. Uh, I'm a co-founder at Helix. We do lots of advisory work in the off-chain compute space. And uh, the topic of this uh, esteemed panel here is basically the future of the Filecoin ecosystem, which I think is a, a topic that should be relevant to anybody who's decided to come spend a couple of days in Vegas. So basically, I think that the Filecoin ecosystem is at a very interesting inflection point that's kind of gone through uh, rev number one. And I think, uh, I think lots of people who are very smart and thoughtful are thinking about what rev number two looks like. So we have a very, uh, I think, eclectic view of a bunch of different perspectives on the panel today. So uh, as a first step, why don't I just ask everyone to give a 30-second introduction of who you are, what you do, and uh, your connection to the Falcon ecosystem. Cool. Thanks, David. It's uh, great to be here with everyone. So Alex Altman, the uh, co-founder and CEO of Seal Storage. We're one of the storage providers in the uh, Falcon ecosystem. We've really focused on onboarding institutional data and specifically focusing on large data sets. Uh, we've worked with many customers. Some of the marquee customers are Atlas at CERN, uh, UC Berkeley, uh, University of, or Columbia University, um, but really focusing on commercializing and uh, the sale of enterprise storage for uh, the Filecoin ecosystem. Hey, my name is Evan Fisher. I have a windy path to get here. I started my career at Goldman covering industrials and investment banking, joined Insight Partners in early 2019, um, saw them grow from 15 billion in AUM to about 90 billion, uh, largest global venture fund at this point, and then spun out to launch a firm called uh, Portal Ventures. We do primarily pre-seed and seed stage crypto and protocol investing, and we've been excited about the Filecoin ecosystem and are actively investing. All right, my name is Lindsay Walker. I'm the product lead for Starling Lab. Um, I started my career as a math teacher, and then I uh, changed, changed directions and got really interested in technology in grad school, and I did a little bit of research on that. Um, I've worked with Protocol Labs as a program manager, um, done a lot of training um, in the technology space, and now uh, I work with Starling Labs, helping to implement and integrate Web3 technologies with partners in journalism, law, and history. So taking these Web3 technologies, uh, explaining them to people who are actually using them and helping them um, put them into, into good use cases that get a lot of coverage with things like AP, Reuters, Rolling Stone, and we've even filed a case with the International uh, Criminal Court for some of the work that we've done. All right, I'm uh, Stefan Vervat. I work for Protocol Labs, head of network growth. Uh, that includes um, uh, in improving the functionality um, to help customers bring data onto the network, um, helping our SP ecosystem, and um, reducing the, the cost of running an SP in infrastructure. And um, yeah, as of late, uh, very focused on my team and the extended teams are very focused on expanding the tooling to, to create the bridge to Web2. Web um, so happy to talk about that in this conversation. All right, so we're going to go through a very logical progression of, at least I think it's logical, of, of, of questions here. So the first question, uh, so I'll just give the audience so you can think about it yourselves as well. So the first question will be, uh, if the Filecoin network is successful in two years, what are the metrics that would lead us to believe it was successful? Uh, the second question is going to be, based upon the answer number one, what are the intermediate metrics that would suggest that we're on a path to success? And then the question number three would be, based upon what needs to happen, who's best positioned in the ecosystem to do what? So we're going to kind of start very macro and then drill down into more tactical uh, and strategic things to get there. So uh, congratulations. You, you'll be the first one to be picked out on this. Fantastic. So just say what metric or metrics you think are most relevant. How, you know, in two years, what will be the North Star metrics that will show us that the Filecoin Net was, is successful, and why do you think that? So I'm actually going to take us back two years to start, and then I'll take us forward. So I think when we initially all started this and we looked at this and decided to participate, it was all about how can we get real data onto this network, right? There was this proof point of we could build a decentralized global network at scale that could take enough data that people could actually use this. And then the next step was can we get data on this? Can we show that people are really, really using this and can use this in an efficient manner and care to use it. And I think that's really what the last two years have been about. And so when I look at the next two years, it's, you know, we've proven out that 
I think there's like an exabyte and a half at this point of real data, which is a metric ton of data that's on the network. I think it's really looking at you know not only the improving the amount of data that's on the metric or on the met, uh, the network, but actually having decentralized storage and Filecoin as a staple of uh, optionality on things like Veeam or other um, providers that give you optionality when it comes to where you want to put your storage and making decentralized storage and more specifically the Filecoin ecosystem as a default choice. So I think the two main metrics here really are looking at you know how much data is being onboarded, how much commercial data is being onboarded, but exactly how much of a, an option is Filecoin? Where is it an option? How much has it been proliferated to a point where that it becomes a consistent option that people can, can choose that in their daily life? So, just, I think, so I think the summation is, your thing is number of channel partners that are generating, gener, you know, delivering substantive Filecoin to end users. Essentially, yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm also going to take us back to go forward. Totally cool. Um, so I like to think about protocols and ask the question, how are they de-risked? Like protocols objectively are not traditional software businesses. And so revenue is not what it should be valued on at any point in time. We should say, what's the terminal value of the asset? And what are we doing to de-risk at milestones? So that looks a lot like a biotech business, actually. So what's Filecoin done? Well, it's built a network that works. That's really impressive technical de-risking. It's then built a lot of slack in that network in the form of storage capacity. And that, that to me looks a lot like Amazon building warehouses for seven years to prepare for all the demand that they're gonna see. And so the warehouses are built, the logistics work. The question now is, do people wanna use it? And so how do we measure if people want to use it and it's working? There's one metric, I think. It's just, is the network burning tokens? Like, if the network is in demand, then it should be burning tokens. That means that the storage providers are making money. That means that the asset is valuable. And it's, generally speaking, should be representative of kind of the profit of the business that is the Filecoin protocol. Cool. Um, I really think adoption by by different areas outside of the technology and Web3 space, right? We, know, we all know the value of a, a cryptographically a prov proven and incentivized archival storage solution, but people in other domains don't. We've had some success prototyping in journalism and in history. Uh, the, legal, the legal field, we're gonna have a long and uphill battle. Um, so once we start to get some adoption and usage by different domains and different types of people, for me, that'll be a real metric of success. People are, are believing in this kind of storage that is proven over time, that is incentivized in a different way than just paying your monthly AWS bill. Okay, so I'd say you, your metric is number of logos or something like that. I would like to see uh, 20 different domains that are, that are not necessarily technology focused okay, so, adopting this. Okay, so it's an adoption, met it's an adoption metric, quanti it's a quantitative adoption metric. Sure, yeah, yeah. Okay, perfect. Because yeah. we're gonna come back to these because the next one is you're gonna have to say, here's my metric, here is how we'll know we're getting there if we're being successful, all right. Yeah, I, so I mean, some of them are already mentioned. Uh, we need household names. Um, we need Falcon to be a household household name, um, and so become the standard uh, for storing, um, you know, data in general. That that would be ideal. Uh, two, um, we should be building profitable businesses on top of our network, and so that includes the SB ecosystem, which is currently primarily focused on or. Um, supported by these block awards. So we need to build a self-sustaining network, and I think that's what was mentioned before. Like, hey, if we see a high burn, that means people are actually utilizing utilizing the network. And so one indicator could be to track uh, the incoming capital um, into our network. And so that is sort of the key um, driver, in my opinion, is that we need to drive towards unique uh, capital coming into the network, because that indicates that customers are willing to pay for storing data on the network, which also indicates that we actually provided real value that is either differentiating or cheaper. Ideally, you want it to be differentiating. So for me, it's like the household names, true capital moving into the network and building profitable businesses on top, on the, on the top side of, uh, meaning on the, on the, the top end of the, the network and on the uh, bottom side of the network. So because we're a two-sided marketplace. Okay, so yours is uh, kind of an adoption story plus like network level revenue and profit, if I could. Okay, so we're gonna go the, the reverse direction on the way back over here. Okay. So no time to, yeah, you've, already, we've, you've already thought about this though. Yeah. So what are the two or three major submetrics 
or you know, intermediate metrics that you'd be tracking over time to, to judge whether or not we're on the path to the outcome that you see in two years? Yeah, I think so. One strategy we're um, now working on is to build the Web2 bridge. So what, you know, call it Web2 and a half. Um, if you go back, you want to go back as well? I, I just have to, this has to be okay. a quantitative metric. Okay. So quantitative, the number of Web2 applications that are using Falcon as a storage target in their stack. That would be amazing. Two, the number of data, unique um, use cases that we can call out that are unique to Falcon and unique to demonstrating verifiable storage. Like, for example, I would love to see um, some major, uh, not just household accounts in general in the enterprise, but very specific in certain verticals, specifically AI. I'd love to see OpenAI stand up and say, we're using Falcon because of proof of provenance that was you know, built on proof of verifiable storage. That would be a second one. And then three is sort of like, we haven't even talked about it, but just the growth that Falcon uh, is, is uh, storing data at. So ideally, I would love to see it growing at a faster rate than data is being generated or um, you know, on a year-over-year -year basis. OK, so it's kind of a number of logos and adoption plus this metric we had before, which is kind of amount of data. Right. So, OK, cool. Lindsay. I was not told beforehand I had to have numbers ready. All right. Um, <laughs> I, I told you when we did the pre-interview, I'm just a really, just I, I don't give any information it. before panels, really. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I guess I said 20 different domains that are adopting this. I would want um, each of those 20 domains uh, have five adopters with more than one terabyte of storage, right? Why is that? Right now, a lot of the prototypes we're doing, it's with one or two people. And, and getting this uh, data archived in Filecoin and then making use of that and displaying that and, and making it visible to people, we do it on a very small scale. If we are doing over a terabyte of storage and actually using that data again, it means that we've had to solve a lot of problems that make it adoptable for a mass market. So my, my metric would be in each domain, we have five organizations with over a terabyte of storage that they're actively retrieving as well. That's great. Yeah. Well done. So uh, I'll kind of repeat some of the things that we heard because it when I, when, I, when I think about Filecoin, I think about how do you underwrite it like a business? And I think we can agree that the most interesting single item for a business from an investor standpoint is how much money is it making? And everything else piles into that. And so when I hear, okay, it can be a Web2 business that's driving volume to Filecoin, or it can be a net new use case like verifiable AI, or it could be something like data DAOs, or something we haven't even thought of yet. To me, it doesn't really matter which one of those it is. It's great to have more because it drives my TAM calculation. Like if it's only serving Web2 customers, I'm concerned about TAM. If it's only serving data DAOs, I'm concerned about TAM. The more, the better. Um, so if I turn that into an actual metric, like we'll know it's on its way to success. If it your has- your metrics, the burn metric. So it's gotta be yeah, yeah. metric side to that. Yeah. And so if it has a DeFi-like moment, um, is what I think it needs to be. So there are lots of things that could be built on top of it. I actually don't have a preference for which one it is. Um, I just care that something happens. And a lot of people, I think, when DeFi came up, like there are certain firms out there that like to say, we saw it coming. We knew DeFi was going to be a thing. They didn't. It's survivorship bias because there were four other things that could have been equivalent to DeFi. And so the reality is when I look at any individual one of those, I have no clue what's gonna take off and I don't care which one takes off but I can look at the basket and say something will. And if something does, it's on its way to success. A little bit vaguer than I would have liked, but okay. What, one, <laughs> one, um, one unique scaled product. Okay, so one product that's generating substantive revenue at the network level. Yeah, a Uniswap equivalent. Okay, so it could be a product or it could be a project. Something that's generating a substantial amount of fees that kind of, t that kind of ties in, maybe it ties into the burn, I guess. So yeah, that makes yeah. sense, okay. So in a completely non-biased way, I think the Uniswap of Filecoin is going to be the sale of enterprise storage. Again, no <laughs> not at all biased. No. <laughs> um, so when I look at Filecoin, the consensus mechanism is entirely backed up by not just, or the intention at least, is not just machines, but it's actually the value of the data that's being brought to the network. And so you know, to just drill it down to two basic metrics that I'd like to see that say, like, I think we're on the path to a real disruptive point in storage. 
is one I'd like to see, you know, 25 to 30 percent of the addressable market, which is basically the entire storage market, to have access to decentralized storage as something that they can easily choose and understand what it is to be able to make that decision. And then more specifically, I'd like to see a zettabyte of data actually backing up the Filecoin network. So for those who aren't familiar, that's about a thousand times where we are, slightly under a thousand times where we are today. But um, I think for me, it's definitely achievable based on where, where we're headed. But those would be the metrics that I think would prove, you know, we've gone past the point that we're into success at this point. So going back to the channel metrics, it would be <clears throat> what number of potential storage buyers have access and then how much has been put on the network by those potential buying groups. Exactly, it's, 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 it's access and usage. It's a, ch it's a channel metric though, okay, got it. Now I'm gonna take a little of a side before we go to the specific things required to get to the metrics because I wanna ask Evan something. So there's lots of people in here who uh, uh, might have raised money in the past, might have raised money in the future. Um, when you're looking at ecosystems and ecosystems projects, uh, because they're tied to obviously a greater narrative, can you take me through your thought process of how you kind of underwrite, I think you talked about how you underwrite an ecosystem, but how do you underwrite that interaction between a project and an ecosystem? Are you saying specifically what the project does in the ecosystem? Yeah, exactly, or, or just yes, looking, at, yeah, exactly, yeah, hmm. exactly. Um, how, how do you think about ecosystem bets? Yeah, I don't, I don't think about it in the sense of an ecosystem bet. I look at everything on a standalone basis. Different firms do it in different ways. Um, but the way I look at any project or company is just, is it a great team solving a really hard problem in the potential to be a very large market with the potential for moats, which drives pricing power? And that applies to literally every business on the planet, and I see no reason it should not apply to protocols. Um, so I, I ask that question. Specific to a lot of things within crypto, I like to ask the question of like, what's uniquely unlocked. Um, I tend to actually fall in the camp of I don't think Web2 to crypto is that interesting. I think it's more similar at times to saying we're going to bring um, you know, cross-border transactions on chain. We are. It's just not happening immediately. Um, what is happening immediately is lots of greenfield opportunity. It's like Uniswap, not possible without Ethereum. There are things on Filecoin, and there are things for Web2 providers on top of Filecoin as well that are not possible. But just competing on cost um, or a USP of sovereignty, I think, is a very small TAM today. And just another question, because we're talking about the future of the Filecoin ecosystem. Um, what have you seen other ecosystems do particularly well in terms of engaging with the venture community? And I'm not just talking about the protocol labs or foundation, but when you think about ecosystems have done a good job, like back to your point, Stefan, bringing in external capital, what have they done well in terms of in engaging with the, the venture community? It's, um, it's a lot of marketing, a lot of like go to market, a lot of sharing the vision. Like for better or for worse, a lot of VCs move on FOMO and a lot of capital pools move on FOMO. Um, and that's the reality of the game on the field. So then the, there's also a reality, which is there's kind of path dependency on that. Like the reason certain VCs rationally move in FOMO is they can look around and say, I feel pretty confident five other people are going to help fund this ecosystem and I don't need to take the whole bet. So I was at a panel last week where um, a very high profile traditional venture GP spoke. And he talked about some of the very contrarian bets he's made. And what he said was, we have to think when we're taking a contrarian bet, can we afford to finance this ecosystem or this company for three to five years into the future? Because if we can't, it's hard. And so having more VCs actually creates this path dependency and drives it forward. And that only happens with evangelization and marketing. Cool. And I want to uh, kind of talk about the enterprise space quite quickly because this came up uh, a number of times. So this is for Alex and for Lindsay. I'll start with Alex. Um, what are the lessons you've learned about working with enterprises and for enterprises to bring them into the ecosystem? What, what, what do you wish you would have known when you started and what are ma some of the ma major lessons learned? I'll start with the, the latter and kind of go to the former. I think the, you know, the biggest circle that you can put here is make it easy. Really, they, enterprises don't want to deal with coins. They don't really even want to deal with the blockchain. If you can make it as simple as humanly possible for them to experience the benefits of what the technology has to offer without 
making them change their normal course of business, you're going to have much more success than if you have to go in and explain, you know, there's, there's coins and there's ceiling and there's all these different capacities and there's proofs and all that. It's like, nope, here's all the wonderful elements that you get, your immutability, your chain of custody. I'm going to give that all to you and I'm going to give it to you in a very simple way to use it. The other part of that is make it easy for them to have business continuity in the sense where I'm not going into an enterprise and saying, I need you to switch from Amazon. I need you to switch from Google. So no, I'm bringing an additive technology to your stack that's very easy to implement and then can complement what you're looking for. And then, when it, what was the previous question? Sorry, the previous question. What do you wish you would have known oh. uh, when, when you started that you know now? I guess that. <laughs> Fair enough, yeah. All right, so Lindsay. Um, I, I genuinely think just jumping straight into enterprise and trying to get a really big, slow-moving organization with a lot of different parts isn't the best way to do it. They're not going to take a risk. They're not going to do something new. But what might work is doing it on a smaller scale, doing it with something high profile and something meaningful, um, and, and implementing it that way and making a big splash with it, right? You're not going to say, hey, I want you to switch off of this thing that that's reliable. You, you've seen it around for 10 years and now we're new. We know that the protocols are better. We know that there's good solutions there. Um, but I think uh, prototyping it with really s in smaller increments is a little bit better. What I see in the Filecoin ecosystem is a lot of things, I think of it in sort of four layers, right? We have the protocols and the core things. We're starting to offer services like storage, um, other things like that. I don't think that layer is going to sell to enterprise. I think we need to start to build up some of those smaller things that bring it directly to customers. And once they see that customers are starting to, to adopt it, like a product-led led growth sort of thing, um, then bigger enterprises are willing to come in and say, hey, let's do that. So you know, fund a little bit of a Skunk Works project in there to show that, that we can do this. Cool. Uh, unplanned question. <laughs> Sorry. Um, we'll start with Stefan because we talked about this quite a bit at, 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 over lunch. Um, obviously, blockchain ecosystems are a bit unique because you have the equivalent of a protocol labs or a Filecoin foundation doing certain types of activities. Then you have lots of ecosystem participants doing lots of other activities. That's very distinct and different from traditional Web2 businesses. So if you were thinking about the core functionality that protocol labs or the foundation should be delivering versus what the ecosystem should be delivering, where would you draw that line? Like, wh what would fit into what type of bucket here? Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. So, um, and this will also tie, this style also ties into our strategy. So if you look at the ecosystem, we believe that the ecosystem should take care of the last mile. Um, like actually like the engagement with the customer, the integration at the, peripheral or the end of um, our, our basically our network with the use cases and the, the workflows that the customers are using. Um, we on Protocol Labs in the Falcon Foundation side with the protocol engineers uh, should support the use cases and the requests that are coming in to help our ecosystem partners um, and to help them accelerate um, to that path to the enterprise use cases and, and functionality requirements. So, um, you know, and this is the reason why we started uh, building this bridge that I mentioned earlier, right? So we put a lot of effort in like building some of the standard tooling because what we've seen in the last uh, two years is that there is still um, standardization requirements. I mean, there's a ton of t standardization requirements that came up in some of our dev summits in the last three weeks. Uh, one, of, one of them is sort of like a guideline to how to support GDPR, okay? Not maybe the highest priority, but, you know, or how do uh, storage providers um, support uh, SOC or SOC 2 compliance environments? Definitely now with AI, that is like sort of the standard requirements, like how do you manage my data? So that's um, one of the reasons why we also started the Decentralized Storage Alliance. Um, we sort of like taking a page of the Ethereum playbook uh, where we said, okay, let's build an alliance that's really focused on bringing industry vendors together to like help uh, advocate and also build these new reference architectures. So that is also part of our responsibility is to bring these industry uh, vendors together and to help move the, this, this new technology into the enterprise. But you know, where it stops to answer your question, in my opinion, is we are, um, we can, we are responsible as one of the ecosystem partners in maintaining and, and supporting the protocol and helping build new FIP, um, you know, feature improvements into the protocol to support our path to enterprise. 
And also now uh, we're focused on the middleware, as I call it, right, this bridge, which includes um, a RESTful API as an example. Why did we build a RESTful API? And we're announcing that this week. Um, and, and why are we you know, building these containerized version of uh, containers, uh, containers uh, basically that help facilitate the onboarding process? It is exactly to support what um, Seal, was, Seal Storage was saying, um, is that we need to make it as simple as possible for users to onboard data into the network. And so you know, uh, if you look back to 2006, when Amazon came out with S3, uh, very quickly after that in 2008, you saw this explosion of um, these gateways or on-ramps that converted file to object, we're in that same position right now today. We're in that stage of our network where we have to collaborate with as many gateway on-ramps and Web2 application developers so that we can capture not only Web3 data sets, but also Web2. And um, that's, that's basically what we're going after. Cool. Uh, do you want to go next? Oh, we'll, we'll, we'll mix oh, it up. Okay, oh, yeah, you got it. Line no, it's it. fine. Yeah, go for it. Okay. No, you go uh, for great. it. Great. Yeah, um, so so th there's a mental model I use for protocols, which is um, a, a protocol eliminates OpEx, eliminates operating expenses, and so it gives that to the community. So what, what does that mean? It means a lot of R&D over the long run goes to the community, and a lot of uh, sales and marketing, like go to market, goes to the community. But that happens over time. So with Ethereum right now, it's later stage. Like Lido, hypothetically, could have been on the Ethereum roadmap, but it wasn't. Someone in the community built it as a new product. Um, so if we think that's where something like Filecoin's going, then it seems what's most helpful is within the R&D and the S&M buckets to internalize things that will necessarily help anyone building on top of Filecoin, but things that are focused on specific use cases, it would then make sense to give out to the ecosystem. And then that's just really playing cost of capital appropriately and investing in the highest ROI. And it goes back to what you were saying is that if you're thinking about after that line is clearly drawn, you have to then think about is there enough other people who come in at this on me with me? Is the opportunity big enough? So you leave some things to the market, and that's where you have to come in, like capital comes in. Yeah, and you can make it easier for the market with investments from core. Yeah. Do you want to answer this one? Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's really important also to kind of have, I talked about four layers before. I don't think I elucidated on that. We have the protocols, then we have the services, and I think there needs to be an application layer that, that might obfuscate some of the stuff that people aren't willing to deal with. Um, you know, uh, I don't want to create a MetaMask and create some tokens that do that. Okay, you pay me in fiat, and I will I will take care of this layer for you. Mm -hmm. um, cool. Yeah, so I think a lot of what Stefan was saying, and, and I agree with, in terms of the protocol is basically responsible for building what we always look at as almost like an, an operating system in a sense. And it's making upgrades to those op uh, that operating system, FVM, IPC, all these different components. It's basically taking the core tooling, Lotus, and all these pieces and making it as usable as possible for people to come in and actually utilize that and build businesses on top of it. Yes, you get tertiary benefits of introducing to community. Investors come into it. You have this kind of like ecosystem that you become a part of, and you get to you know, meet all these people and, and then add them into your you know, ecosystem and, and benefit from what they're building. But I think at the end of the day, the difference between kind of what the ecosystem is required to do, and I really like the Lido example, is that, you know, Ethereum, if you want to just go and use Ethereum, there's nothing really to do. You know, you have to go through MetaMask, which uses Infura. You have to go through an application. Like, Ethereum is really just this baseline. It's built like a very robust system that allows people to build on it. And I think any protocol, specifically for, for Filecoin as well, is that's the main focal point. It's building this robust protocol that people can then build systems on top of and then even add layers of infrastructure and keep continuously add layers of infrastructure. And again, going back to that Uniswap example, you know, Uniswap's built on top of two or three different layers on top of Ethereum. And then you know, it's been able to grow significantly from that. But at the end of the day, you know, what was Ethereum responsible for? What is Protocol Labs responsible for? It's making sure that that base layer is robust, the consensus keeps moving, the upgrades keep going, and the usability of the core technology continues to grow. Um, and then the community is able to build off of those systems and then work together to create a more cohesive and expansive overall ecosystem that uh, draws in more capital. OK, great. Uh, so I think we can get back onto the menu again. Um, uh, of course, we're all here because there's lots of great stuff going on here. We all know that. Um, but going back to our, the metrics we picked out, 
Uh, of course, there's areas for improvement. Um, so what are the primary areas of improvement you think that the ecosystem needs? This could be economic, it could be governance, it could be technological, in order to get on the progress to those intermediate metrics that we, that we talked about, and ultimately the longer-term metrics. So if people were focusing their time and energy, this could be people in the ecosystem, Protocol Labs, Filecoin Foundation, where, where should that effort be focused to meaningfully move the needle over the next 12 months? Okay, I get to start with the tough one. Um, yeah, so it, I mean, it kind of relates to what I was just saying before, right? Like there's Protocol Labs is continuing to build out this underlying infrastructure. And then I think the, the next level, at least to me, is the storage provider level, right? Like that's one of the main constituencies of who's part of this ecosystem and who builds a lot of the technology that actually allows for data to come into the system. Um, and then we are the ones who use you know, the DeFi and, and all the other you know, applications that are being built. Um, so I think the storage providers need to work together more cohesively to create a more standardized system of tooling. And I think Stefan was mentioning something like that as well, where you don't want to end up with everybody building their own way of interacting with Filecoin, their own way of tracking deals, their own way of Im implementing you know, how they intake data, how they take data off of the system, because then you have you know, a decentralized system that you have to choose between, do I use my software stack? Do I use someone else's software stack? Do we you know, even do this deal because it's too complicated to do? And then you lose the whole core element of decentralization. And so I think this point of um, you know, more standardization and collaboration on some of these core elements that don't necessarily require differentiation, but require agreement in a sense. Good answer. Yeah. I think the most important thing to focus on is more demand for the network. Slack exists. Um, Amazon has the warehouses. Now let's figure out what sells. And that could be more deals with valuable data from enterprises whereby they're willing to pay meaningful sums. But I think it also should be number of apps built on top of FVM because it's a big value prop to the enterprises at the end of the day to be able to say, we make our money from block rewards in addition to you. And we are therefore not just more sovereign. We don't have like benefits that are tech. We have benefits that are economic as well. And that can push through a lot of large enterprise organizations all of a sudden. Um, so, so in short, it's having more novel applications built on top of FVM. Okay, so it's getting focused on customer acquisition. Okay, great. Try it out in the wild and work with other people. Take, take your baby that you think you, you built and you thought of everything that you could possibly use it for and bring it to other people who, who want to kick the tires. And while you're doing that, bring in other groups that are building similar things because that way you can figure out what you specialize in and what you want. Um, you know, it's been said, uh, this community is very heavy in certain demographics, and I think once you start to kick the tires and bring it out into the wild, new things happen. You know, I was having a meeting this morning with one person who made a tool to scrape and get web archives, and then I was meeting with somebody else who was trying to display these records, also the records of the IPFS, uh, IPFS hash and blockchain registrations and that kind of thing. We're trying to get a WordPress plugin working. We, we thought of all these things that they did, it never occurred to them, oh, we should build this into the tool when we're collecting it. Um, so I really think it's important to take it into the wild and do that with groups of other people. Awesome. So experimentation, get it out there, uh, get other people involved. Cool. Yeah, yeah I mean, like uh, most of it is already mentioned, but we need to drive down cost, meaning we need to optimize the cost of um, running a storage provider system. That's something that, you know, on the, on the PL side, but also um, the DSA alliance that's been like a main focus area, like thanks to you know, Supranational, AMD, and other vendors that are participating. Um, so that's one. Two is building more differentiation. And so that comes back to getting us or getting in front of more use cases and end customers and really talking about the benefits of verifiable storage. And now that we have some of these tools, like these RESTful APIs, Ideally, it should be a lot easier to go to an application developer and say, you don't have to worry about like this whole wide ecosystem of like storage providers and these actors and no, just you know, use what you're used to using today, which is a RESTful API. You don't have to install anything, just get 
you know, your apps integrated with this API and tell us what your needs are, what your bottlenecks are, and how we can help differentiate by building some maybe future types of proofs on chain that could really drive uh, differentiation. And the third one is indeed driving demand, like really creating more awareness. We started the dstore.com, dstore.com, um, AI website um, like uh, a couple of months ago. Um, and actually what we have seen in the last six or eight months is that de the word decentralized storage is being searched for a lot more. And it's amazing to see that, you know, even in the last month, we kind of talked about it, right? The verifiable web, right? The, the, the terminology verifiable web or um, the ability to verify that your data is created by whoever says they created it and, and then eventually is stored and the integrity is maintained. That is super crucial more than any, than any time before now that this AI wave is sort of changing the belief system and making, real, making people really understand how important and valuable their data sets are. So um, that's where we need to keep pushing forward and working with analysts, which is what we're doing in any form or way that we can to really advocate for um, this new uh, decentralized approach that will bring value to the enterprise. And that's what we've been focusing on, but we need everyone's help. Yeah. And let me just get more specific. So in terms of making Filecoin enterprise ready, what are the top recommendation or a couple of things you think need to happen for that to occur? Yeah, I think it's, uh, it's just going back to that component of easy. Like you can't go into these enterprises with, and say, hey, I, I need you to replace your systems. I need to explain all of these different components to you. Obviously, it's very helpful if they understand from a marketing perspective what they're getting into and where they can get an advantage of. But it's like, try this. Just like, here's an easy way for you to try this. And go ahead and do that. And then what we've found and what we've experienced uh, at Seal is that once these companies start to try the storage, and once they try to, when they start to try the technology, they're like, I actually want to do more of this. I want to experience more of this. I want to know. What can I do with IPFS? How do I use IPFS? Uh, how can I do caching layers in here? Can I do you know, multiple replications? How fast can I get those replications? So it's really getting that foot in the door of just saying, look, just, this is easy for you to try. There's no harm for you to try this. And then you know, pushing into that and then continuing to expand the overall ecosystem's, um, I guess, view in the world where people say, yes, the centralized storage is an option for me. I know what that is, and I actually, I want to go to someone, I want to try that, and I want to integrate that into my storage stack. So it's really just usability and viewability. L let me make the question harder for, for Evan and next people. How do you get people to pay you in dollars for this? <laughs> like, w what are the steps required to get more storage providers paid in more dollars? And if you, if you, you can take it or pass it, because I know this isn't your... Um, <laughs> I, I think just having a product that is a replacement for okay, so you, so you, you so basically what Alex said. Yeah, but then okay. I, where, where I would, if, when I think about the enterprise motion, I break it out into two categories. It's rip and replace, and then it's net new. Um, and so if we think about cloud storage, a lot of companies were hesitant to go to cloud storage. There are still companies that are on-prem. Like it took healthcare ages to move to cloud for the ones that did. Um, and so something similar, I expect, happens where there's some category of companies whereby it will make sense to be on decentralized storage. Now, I take it a step further, which is to say, as Uber was a cloud-native company, which is now an enterprise, I think there will be decentralized native companies, i.e., like, on top of FVM, that become enterprises and only are possible because of decentralized storage. And I think that's a really easy sales motion where they will pay you in whatever currency you need because they need you. So the answer is they need to ha need you. All right, I want to be paid in Pepe. Yeah. Okay, next. Um, yeah, I mean, cloud storage took a, took a long way to adopt, but I don't even think that it's necessarily the future. It takes a lot to send per petabytes of data for uh, the processing you need to run an autonomous vehicle. Decentralized storage could be the answer to that, right? If we have a secure storage closer to where that commute, compute needs to happen, it's, it's a better service than a cloud service. Okay, so, so think about how we're differentiating. How do well. I make it a better service? Okay, yeah. we got 55 seconds left, so I'm going to ask you, and then I got my lightning round at the end here. Probably have half an hour to answer that very better <laughs> question, but uh, no, I think in general, um, adding the basic functionality, we're not at the basics yet, meaning like we don't have access control, for example, we don't have encryption, erasure coding. So some of the basic capabilities that really are like table stakes for enterprise customers, right, are now 
the, now we're sort of like depending on the, the application, the ecosystem partners that are engaging with the end customer to bring that forward, but we have to build some of that um, into the stack or around the stack and standardize like what Alex was saying so that there's economies of scale that we can achieve. Um, and then, you know, finding that real uh, that, that real sticky use case that no one else has. We're not positioning Falcon today as a replacement for cloud by any means because of the lack of functionality, but we're positioning as a displacement, like, you know, as you're expanding, as you're building new use cases, please explore decentralized storage. And so there's a lot to do there, but anyway, I'll leave it at that. All right, now it's time for the lightning round. Okay, everyone's gonna have 10 seconds to think about this. All right, so. When we're back here on this panel again together next year in Vegas, and we look back on the last 12 months in the Filecoin ecosystem, in three words or less, what will we say? All right, 10, nine, eight, seven. We're gonna start right here and go down the line. Six, five, four, three, two, one, go. Well, that worked. That was cool. Efficient retrieval. Fucking amazing. Hell yeah. <laughs> All right, thank you to everybody. Appreciate you.